Hello everyone and welcome back. So I do think that a lot of you have probably gotten a bit too tired with all the theory videos that I've been making recently. So I thought I would return to my roots and make a video involving both uh, theory and experiment. So this is that video. And in this video I'll actually be trying to determine whether objects of different shapes when they roll down and incline whether they take the same time in reaching the bottom or whether they, they take different times. And the title of the video has probably told you that they do in fact take different times. Now before getting into the theory behind that, I am just going to conduct the experiment without any assumptions like a scientist would. And it's not just me who's conducting the experiment but also me, my dad who has actually helped me significantly with the experimental apparatus this time around which has led to it being significantly better than the makeshift apparatus that I had in the first X video. So without further ado, let's go and look at what, exper what the experimental apparatus is. So this right over here is our experimental setup. As you can see, it consists of books that have been taped together to ensure that there are no bumps that the objects encounter which will kind of mess up our experiment. And the reason it has been made so long is in order to ensure that we can easily record our time interval. Now the objects themselves include a hollow sphere, which is basically a ping pong ball. And then we also have a hollow cylinder, which is made of plastic, which we found lying somewhere around the house. And then the third object is actually a solid cylinder, which is basically the hollow cylinder, but with, with clay filled in it. Now the experiment itself is quite easy to conduct. All it involves is gently pushing the object down the incline and then recording the time taken by it to reach the bottom. Now you have to push it gently to ensure that you don't impart any additional momentum to the object. And you can record the time interval in any way, but the way that I did it was to record the timestamp at the moment uh, it was at the top of the incline and the timestamp at the moment it was at the bottom of the incline using my editing software and finding the difference between the two. Now the Excel file that you're seeing actually includes the values of time for multiple trials. We conducted five trials each for uh, each object as you can see over there. And then we took the average of those to reduce experimental error. Now, one conclusion that can be easily drawn is the fact that they do in fact take different times to go down the incline. And another conclusion is the fact that the hollow sphere takes the uh, least time and the so hollow cylinder in fact takes the most time. So that was the experiment. And our conclusion simply stated is the fact that objects of different shapes when they are rolled down and inclined, they take different times for doing so. So before I actually answer the why part of this question, I will answer the why not part of the question. That is, why is it that they don't all take the same time in going down the incline? So, and the reason for a person thinking that is pretty obvious because you might think that the same force of gravity is acting on it. So like the same force of gravity along the incline that is mg sin theta and also the same magnitude of friction because the normal reaction will also be the same that is mg cos theta like we saw in the first video. And you can also argue that the coefficient of static friction is the same because all the objects that we have over here are plastic. This is a plastic, this is plastic. and the surface used in all the experiments is the same. So the coefficient of static friction should also logically speaking be the same. As a result, the magnitude of friction acting on the body will also be the same. And hence the net force will be the same for all of them. Net acceleration will be the same. And we could also argue then that the time taken by the bodies to reach the bottom will also be the same. And at the surface level, this actually seems pretty plausible. But the reason for us, this entire explanation is actually wrong because the magnitude of friction acting on the this body right here is not the same for all the cases. That is, the magnitude of friction acting in this case is not the same as the magnitude of friction acting in this case. And this is what we'll be exploring in the video. But generally speaking, this the reason for this is actually because of two false assumptions that we made while while we follow like why we actually do follow this line of reasoning the first is the fact that this object right here is not a point mass it has dimension it has volume 
and so the forces do not always have to act on a center of mass. It is true that the force of gravity acts on the center of mass. However, the force of friction only acts along the line of contact. So suppose a body is moving like this. The force will only act along this point of contact, that is the point where the sphere and the surface, that is the book, make contact. So that is the only place that the friction will be acting. And the consequence of this is actually pretty interesting, which we will be talking about soon enough. And the second reason is the fact that this body right here is not, again, it's not a point mass and that the fact that it can rotate. Since it is not a point mass but actually a system of particles, all these particles are rotating about one point and that point is the center of mass. So we can't simply use our reasoning of linear mechanics, that is we can't simply just use f is equal to ma. We also have to take into account rotational mechanics, that is torque is equal to i alpha and other similar concepts and then evaluate this experiment. And another interesting thing to note is you see that the object moves as soon as I tilt the incline. That is, it doesn't matter what the angle is, the object will move. So, but what we saw in the first video was that the object only starts moving when the angle is greater than the angle of repose. That is, when the angle is greater than the angle of friction or the angle of repose. But you notice that it starts moving in this case as soon as the book is raised. So we can clearly see that something fishy is going on with the friction over here. So to investigate all of that, we'll now move on to one note where we'll actually evaluate this experiment using both linear mechanics and rotational mechanics. So see you there. All right then. Well, this right over here is a free body diagram of the experiment that we have over here. But before I begin describing this diagram, I actually want to go over what rolling in physics actually means. Well, rolling in physics is a superposition of both rotation and uh, translation. So suppose if I have a sphere over here, luckily enough, I have ink to shape, so it sort of becomes smooth. Okay, so if I have a sphere over here, let's assume this is a sphere, and this is the ground, okay? So if, uh, if I were to just push it with a force over here, it would start moving, right? And so it would acquire what I would like to term a velocity of the center of mass, that is the velocity with which the entire sphere is translating forward, that is it is moving forward in a straight line. So when it acquires a velocity of the center of mass, the point that is in contact with ground, with the ground is actually not at rest, not, a, not in rest relative to the ground. So as a result, there is friction that acts on the point of contact in this direction to lower the velocity of the center of mass. Now, if this were an object that couldn't rotate, the static friction that's acting over here would only lower the velocity of the center of mass. But since this is an object that can also rotate, what happens is that friction causes there to be an angular velocity developed in the object in this direction because it's acting along this line over here. So the velocity due to the angular velocity at this point will actually be equal to V is equal to omega R, okay? Such that the net velocity of this point, I can write the net velocity at this point to be V is equal to V center of mass minus omega R. Now remember that the friction over here only opposes relative motion between this point and the surface over here and so that the hence the statement i made a few minutes ago so since this friction only opposes relative motion over here it is only concerned with when this velocity is equal to zero so when it keeps acting and when this and when this velocity will become zero we can say v center of mass is equal to omega times r and when this happens we say that the object is in pure rolling motion. And so this over here is the condition for what we call pure rolling motion. When this point over here, that when that is when the object is rotating, whatever points come whatever point of the object comes over here will always be at rest instantaneously. When it is over here, it's not at rest, and when it is over here, it's not at rest. But when it comes over here, the velocity of the center of mass and velocity due to rotation are equal and the 
there and thus it is at instantaneous rest and thus it is it is not in relative motion with the surface and thus there is no friction acting so the friction that is acting in case of objects that only translate and objects that roll is actually different which is what i talked about earlier alternatively we could also differentiate this expression with respect to time and so we could write this as dv center of mass by dt is equal to and we're going to assume that the radius of the object remains constant so we can write this as r times d omega by dt now this over here is nothing but the acceleration of the center of mass and this over here is nothing but the angular acceleration of the body so keeping these things in mind let's actually begin evaluating the free body diagram now over here we see that the force over here acts downwards so the velocity of the center of mass of this object tries to increase in this direction as a result the frictional force acts in this direction because the this point over here wants to move in this direction so the angular velocity that is created is in this direction okay and there is also something that this frictional do, friction does this friction over here this angular velocity is actually created because the friction over here provides a torque and why only the friction provides a torque is because this is the only force that does not act along the center of mass it acts perpendicular to it if you'll see over here the force of gravity actually acts downwards and the normal reaction acts through this point but it passes through the center of mass therefore uh, the uh, these forces don't exert any torque because we know that torque is actually equal to r cross f all right and since r that is the distance of that force you can it's actually the force arm but you can think of it here as a distance of this force from the center of mass from the, or from the point that it is rotating about since r is zero for mg and n we can say that the torque due to them is zero so therefore only the frictional force of sphere exerts a torque on the sphere so we can say f r is equal to torque and we actually have another expression for torque and that is equal to i alpha where i is the moment of inertia of the body and alpha is the angular acceleration of the body which is something that we just got over here so to solving for friction we find that f is equal to i alpha by r however remember that this value of friction can only be achieved as long as there is not greater than the limiting value and that is the reason why i took the angle of in the incline in the experiment to be very small because if the angle of incline were very large then this value would probably exceed the value of uh, limiting friction because alpha would be very high and thus it would actually not be pure rolling motion because the velocity of the center of mass would most likely be greater than omega r and there would be kinetic friction and things would really get messy so i decided not to go that route so this was the rotational uh, equation of motion that we could get from this situation now most of you are probably more comfortable with linear motion so we'll get an equation for that as well we see that uh, mg sin theta is acting in this direction and f is acting in this direction and the net force caused due to these two forces will actually be the acceleration of the center of mass so we can say mg sin theta minus f is equal to m a so now we can actually substitute this value of f from this equation over here so we can say mg sin theta minus and now i'm going to substitute this value of alpha from this equation over here so i can actually write this as um, i into a, a center of mass this is actually a center of mass a center of mass by r square and this value over here is equal to m into a center of mass now i could leave the i over here in the expression but there is a way to make it uh, neater i can write i is equal to k into m r square where 
K is actually the radius of gyration of the body and depends on the mass distribution. That's not something that we need to get in over here. In fact, I made a video on the moment of inertia of various bodies. So if you'd like, that's something that you can view as well. So mg sin theta is uh, equal to m a center of mass. I've shifted this to the other side plus i and i'm going to substitute this value of i over here so i'll just try this is uh, k into m r square plus k into m r square by r square into a central mass now that this expression is going to be massively simplified i can cut this over here i can cut the mass in all these Area. So this expression simply simplifies to g sin theta is equal to 1 plus k into a center of mass. Alright, so then we can write a center of mass is equal to g sin theta by 1 plus k. Okay, so this in itself should be enough to justify that since the net acceleration of the center of mass is different and the bodies will take different times but if you really are picky then we can solve for the time as well by using our equations of motion we can let the uh, length of the incline to be l so we can say that l is equal to a center of mass dot t square by 2 by applying our equations of motion so t can actually be written as uh, root of 2L by A central mass and if we substitute the value that we just found we can find that T is actually equal to 2L into 1 plus K by G sin theta and this is our expression for time taken by the body to hold on an incline of length L and so using this expression, we can actually answer the question that we asked in the beginning of the video. Now, if you'll see, all factors except k are constant for the bodies mentioned. And k actually depends upon the mass distribution of the body. k is actually least for the cylinder, solid cylinder, which is actually 1 by 2, and it is the most for the hollow cylinder. So since it's the most for the hollow cylinder, we can clearly see that t is actually directly proportional to k and thus uh, t is most for the hollow cylinder but contrary to what this formula actually tells us we found that uh, the hollow, hollow sphere was actually the body that took the least amount of uh, time to reach the bottom so naturally i was quite confused because this is contrary to what our uh, theory experiments told us so i actually asked my physics teacher and he told me that uh, this the reason for this reason for the hollow sphere uh, reaching first is because the solid cylinder actually experiences a significant uh, rolling friction due to which its velocity of center of mass decreases as, as it is rolling down the incline causing the time for it to reach down greater so that's what I meant when I said uh, at the beginning of the video to come in the experiment without assumptions because I was completely ready to say that the solid cylinder would actually be the first to reach the bottom of the incline when I first conducted the experiment. And so physics surprises you every day, you know. And that is what I truly love about it. It's unpredictable and it's beautiful. So I hope you liked this video that I made personally speaking i did put a lot of effort into it in fact it's i've been working on this video the whole day and it's about 11 o'clock right now so thank you for for going through this video with me and thanks for watching